Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation of Morning in the Morning, Abelard Reynolds and America's First Indoor Mall. I'm Brandon Fess with the Local History and Genealogy Division of the Rochester Public Library. Thank you to the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery for their support for this series. The city of Rochester is well known for its innovators and inventors, but did you know that the city was the home of the first of the largest and most expensive building in the United States west of Albany? This month's Morning in the Morning focuses on the life and innovations of Abelard Reynolds, a significant but overlooked innovator during Rochester's earliest days. Our presenter today is Sarah Johnson. Sarah is a member of the Friends of Mount Hope, the volunteer organization tasked with supporting renovations of the cemetery and preserving the stories of those buried there. Sarah leads tours of the cemetery and writes for the FOMH newsletter, Epitaph. She's a recovering management consultant and holds graduate degrees from The Ohio State University. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Johnson. Thank you very much, Brandon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for spending part of this snowy Saturday morning with us to talk about interesting history in the city of Rochester. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with all of you the story of Abelard Reynolds, but also the legacy of the Reynolds family in Rochester, because the more I learn about it, the more significant I see the, that legacy being to the city. Now, Brandon's told you a little bit about me. There, you know, you can see me in that little box in your Zoom screen, but this is, uh, these are some bigger pictures of me. I am not a native to the Rochester area. I transplanted here a number of years ago. Um, I've always been a bit of a history buff, and now I am excited about becoming more of a, what, what I would call an amateur historian in the work that I do with the friends of Mount Hope. Um, in the years that I've lived in Rochester, I visited the cemetery a number of times, but it was during the pandemic, the long walks that I took in the cemetery during lockdown where I truly fell under the spell of Mount Hope Cemetery. So I joined the friends and I became a tour guide last year and I have thoroughly enjoyed learning all of the stories about, uh, about the people who are buried there. So let me fill you in on what we're gonna talk about today. I became aware of Abelard Reynolds as I was preparing for a tour that I did with Pat Corcoran, who is the uh, president of the Friends of Mount Hope. I was absolutely hooked on his story from the jump. And I, but when I did the tour, I, I really only scratched the surface of Abelard Reynolds' uh, legacy within Rochester. So as I'm preparing, as I was preparing for this particular presentation, I fell down many, many rabbit holes. And my plan today is to take you down those rabbit holes with me. So today we're gonna to talk about Abelard's early years and get a hint at what motivated him to come to Rochester and do all of the things that, and, and accomplish all the things that he accomplished. We'll talk about the arcade, but we'll also go into some detail on the, the Reynolds family legacy, both the Athenaeum and the Reynolds Library. We'll spend a bit of time talking about the will, which was a salacious little story that hit the Democrat and Chronicle. And we'll finally end up talking about the Reynolds family plot at Mount Hope because it wouldn't be morning in the morning if we somehow didn't link back to gravestones and the cemetery. Now, my plan is to leave plenty of time at the end of this for questions. But in the midst of the presentation, if you have a question, please drop that in the chat box or the Q&A box. Brandon will keep an eye on that and uh, will ask me those questions as we go along. And full disclosure, as I said, I'm an amateur historian. I will do your best to answer my questions, um, but I will fully acknowledge when I don't know the answer. Okay, so let's get started and let's start at the start. So Abelard was born in Red Hook, New York. It's in Dutchess County. Uh, it's north of Rhinebeck, east of the Hudson River. His father uh, was a farmer and a saddler, and he moved the family multiple times during Abelard's early years. Now, Abelard very much followed in his father's footsteps. He became his father's apprentice um, in the saddling business. And at age 20, Abelard is released from his apprenticeship. He strikes out on his own for the first time up in Manchester, Vermont. 
um, to work as a saddler. And he earns his first $100, which had to have been a very empowering experience. So he returns to Berkshire County where his family eventually settled. He buys a farm. He opens up his, he does saddling work. He eventually marries a young woman named Lydia Strong um, and is, is living in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Now, when you think about it, he's living his father's life. He's farming, he's, saddler, he's, he's a saddler, he is married. Like many men of his generation, he had an itch to do something bigger and better and, and, and greater than what he had been doing. He didn't wanna live his father's life. And for men in the early part of the 19th century, where do you go to create that bigger life? Well, you go west. And then that's exactly what he set out to do. But where exactly would he make his, where would he stake his claim and create this new life for himself? So he undertook several scouting missions to figure out where he wanted to go. All right, so first he starts off uh, in 1811, he sets off from Pittsfield and he heads up to Lowville, Watertown, Brownsville, and finally to Sackett's Harbor. Nothing in that area appealed to him, so he returned to Pittsfield. He then sets out on a second scouting mission. Um, he travels through Western New York, Northern Pennsylvania, eventually finding himself in Warren, Ohio, which is very close to present day Youngstown, Ohio. He likes what he sees in Warren, Ohio, and he makes the decision that that is where he's gonna stake his claim, create his new life. He heads back to Pittsfield to get his affairs in order so that he can come back to Warren and purchase property. Now on his way back to Warren, he travels further through Western New York. He uh, goes to Rome, Manlius, Skinny Atlas, Geneva, Canandaigua, and Bloomfield. And while he is in Bloomfield, he hears great things about a new settlement in Charlotte. And he decides, well, as long as I'm in the area, I'm going to head up to Charlotte and see what that's all about. So he heads in that direction, but on his way, he comes across the 100-acre tract. This is the piece of property that uh, uh, Nathaniel Rochester, Charles Carroll, and William Fitzhugh have staked out, which forms the nucleus of what eventually becomes Rochester, New York. Now, while he is at the 100 acre track, he meets Enos Stone, who is living there, but also acting as the agent, the sales agent for Nathaniel Rochester and his colleagues. Now, Abelard likes what he sees. He sees that it's close to a water source. He sees the power of the waterfalls. He sees the potential of this particular property. Now he eventually heads up to Charlotte to check that out, but he can't get the 100 acre tract out of his mind. So he returns to, uh, he returns to the tract and he purchases two lots, lots 23 and lots 24. And what he says to Enos Stone is, I want a piece of land that is on an east-west street on the north side of that east-west street. And that is why he chooses lots 23 and 24. Now, in addition to these two lots, he also purchases 100 acres of farmland a little bit outside of the city. And he trades the deed for his farm in Pittsfield, Massachusetts for the property outside the city, as well as for a horse and a cutter. Now, before he leaves the area, he builds a foundation for a home uh, out of river rocks that he collects out of the Genesee River. And he commissions a frame house to be built in his absence on that foundation. Now, in February of 1813, he returns to Rochester uh, with his family. He moves here in, 18, in February 1813. He brings Lydia, his wife, his toddler son, William, his Lydia's sister, Hulda, and his brother-in-law, excuse me, Lydia's brother-in-law helps them move out. Now, is there a worse time to move to Rochester than in February? 
which it's no surprise that the brother-in-law would make this statement, their home is in a dismal swamp. They must inevitably starve. Now, it was a grim place when you think about it. There wasn't much here in this area uh, in, in February of 1813. Now, I've marked lots 23 and 24 there in that red box. It's a map of Rochester in 1814. Now, not long after they moved to this area, uh, Abelard contracts swamp fever, which was a relatively common malady at the time. And he is bed sick, very sick for six months. In the meantime, it, it, it is up to Lydia to keep the family fed and to keep their heads above water. She takes in some tailoring, uh, which she does piecework for. She takes in uh, borders, kind of running it in, in their home. Um, but despite all of these challenges, there is a great sense of community in the area. And um, I've read several books that describe Lydia's kitchen as the pleasantest place in the village. Now, Abelard eventually recovers from the sickness and very quickly makes himself indispensable in the village, not only uh, in providing services as the saddler, the postmaster, the magistrate and innkeeper, but he becomes a pillar of the community. He is uh, a mason. He, is, he operates as the fire warden for the first ward. He does some time in the state legislature, although politics was never to his taste, never to his liking. He becomes a trustee of not only the Methodist Episcopal Church, but also a trustee of the Bank of Rochester. He becomes such a pillar of the community that when the Erie Canal opens, he is aboard the boat, the Young Lion of the West, along with Nathaniel Rochester and others to celebrate the opening of the Erie Canal. But as they say in infomercials, but wait, there's more. Uh, he had so much more to contribute to this young and growing city. Now, before we get to that, let me set some context. The city of Rochester had grown exponentially since its early days, and the opening of the Erie Canal accelerated this growth. Now, in 1814, not long after Abelard had moved here, the city of Rochester only had 151 residents. But by the time the Erie Canal opened in 1825, there were over 5,200 residents and growth only accelerated from there. By 1830, there were almost 11,000 residents in Rochester. Now, Abelard hatches a plan, and I would say this is a visionary plan. What is it that a growing city with huge potential really need? Well, that growing city with great potential needs a center of commerce and industry. So he hatches a plan for an audacious building project. He decides that he is going to build what ultimately is the largest and most expensive building west of Albany and outside of New York City. This building is huge. It is a 99 feet frontage on Main Street. It is 56 feet deep. It contains uh, what, you know, 86 rooms. And when, when I think they refer to rooms, what they mean is different offices or shop space within, within the building itself. It had 14 basements, not 14 levels below ground, but rather 14 basement spaces um, in the lower level of the building. Now, plenty of citizens in Rochester thought he was crazy to do this. What they said is he has bitten off a big chew. And in fact, this was an expensive project. It was heavily mortgaged, but Abelard bet right. By 1835, seven years after the arcade was built in 1828, Rochester had over 14,000 citizens. And I just wanna remind you, this is 1828 when he is building this kind of building. There'd never been this kind of building in the United States. 
Now, here is where that building was located. This map is from 1910. You can see where the building is situated. I've circled it there. You can see where it marks the arcade. Um, it is on Main Street uh, near the Four Corners, the intersection of Main and State Street just west of the uh, Genesee River. Now, let me ask you a question. Does this location look familiar? It should. It is the lots 23 and lots 24. This is where, this is the original property that Abelard uh, bought. It's also where he'd located his house. So where's the house? Well, he moved the house to make way for the arcade. He moved his family, moved his shop so that they could use that property to build the arcade. So it may have been a nice place to live, but it's an even better place to do business. Right, now, this particular view gives you a better idea. There's another picture of the arcade on the left, but you can see there's sort of a, a plan for the lower level of the building. It gives you a better idea of the layout. Now on the first floor, there were five storefronts that opened directly onto Main Street. You can see those five um, right there. Now, as you enter the arcade, there was a long corridor that ran from Main Street all the way through the building onto Exchange Place. And that corridor was a four-story atrium. I'll show you some internal pictures in a minute. Um, the shops that ran along the corridor opened directly onto the corridor. At the back of the corridor, you can see it there on the uh, back right, was the um, post office. And Abelard continued as the postmaster until 1829, but the post office itself remained in the arcade for 50 years. Now, this is kind of genius to put the post office in the arcade. At the time, there was no home delivery of mail. If you wanted to retrieve your mail, send a package or send a letter, you had to go to the post office to do it, which meant you had to go to the arcade. And of course, as long as you were at the arcade, you may as well stay and do a little shopping. Now here's a drawing of the interior. I'll, again, I'll show you pictures in a minute, but anything that you could want or need to accomplish, you could do at the arcade. And I love this quote, from John Rothwell Slater. He says, along its little galleries were shops, factories, offices, studios, clubs, barbers and tailors, dentists and jewelers and boot blacks, a little of everything. You could buy a suit, pawn a watch, see a doctor, meet a friend, escape a bore, borrow money, sell a bond, send a telegram, read a paper, get a shine, eat a meal, play a game of chess and buy flowers for the lady. Or you could hire a desk and wait for customers to come pouring in. Leisure and haste were joint tenants. Now, while the residents of Rochester may have thought the arcade was foolish, it never lacked for tenants. And almost from the start, it was fully, uh, fully let out. Now, let me show you some external views. That view on the left is from 1932. The picture was taken not long before the um, arcade was torn down. And you can see on the right, some earlier views of the exterior. Now it's an imposing building. You can see how large it is. It had some architectural interest, a mansard roof, as well as sort of that, that section with the widow's walk in the middle. Now, these are two photographs from the interior. And in these shots, we've got our backs toward Exchange Place and we are looking toward Main Street. Now you can see, first of all, there's a light filled atrium. Now that glass roof was not original to the building. Um, it was an addition that was made at great expense a number of years after the arcade was built. They brought in iron rafters and 70 tons of plate glass to create that glass atrium. Now you can see that there are two open levels and two enclosed levels. Now those open levels were shops and offices and those shops and offices are opened directly either onto the main floor or onto that balcony section on the second floor. The third floor was a hotel and the fourth floor were studios for artists and photographers. 
Now in this picture on the right, you can better see the clock. Uh, you can see the clock in both pictures, but it's a little bit clearer that it's a clock in the picture on the right. And right below the clock on either side are two busts. The bust on the left is a bust of Abelard Reynolds who built the arcade. The bust on the right is a bust of his son, William Reynolds, who eventually ran the arcade for his father. Over time, a third bust was added, which was right above the clock. That was a bust of Mortimer Reynolds, who was Abelard's second son. There was also a very large mural of Niagara Falls on that front wall, uh, on the Main Street wall. Now this is, uh, now we are looking at a picture where we've got our backs to Main Street, we're looking toward Exchange Street. And on this picture on the left, you can see the original ceiling of the arcade, which eventually was replaced with that all glass ceiling that you see on the right. The arcade, excuse me, the Exchange Place side of the uh, arcade was all glass. So this place was flooded with natural light. And think about it, how genius is this? is this? We all know what winter is like in Rochester. How lovely to be able to come to a place where you can run all of your errands indoors outside of the, we outside of the snow and, and all of the weather. Now, the arcade quickly became a Rochester institution. And in 1880, on average, about 25,000 people a day passed through the arcade. And I love this quote from Jenny Marsh Parker. She says, the arcade is the channel through which the converging streams of our municipal life flow in a steady, quiet stream. It stamped our individuality when we were hardly expected to have individuality. It is preeminently the monument of the enterprise and the seership of early Rochester and the birthplace of much that has shaped our destiny. Now, this was a unique facility that made Rochester unique. Um, and the arcade served a number of different purposes for the community. It was what today we would call a business incubator. Some of Rochester's most significant companies had their first um, offices in the arcade, including Western Union and Bausch and Loam. William's son, or excuse me, Abelard's son, William, started a seed business called Reynolds and Bateman Seeds. And William Reynolds hired a young man by the name of George Elwanger to run that seed business for him. He eventually expanded that business into nurseries. And when he exits that business, he sells those nurseries to George L. Wanger and his partner, Patrick Berry, which serves as kind of the, the nucleus of their L. Wanger and Berry nursery business. He also sells a big chunk of his seed business to Hiram Sibley, who goes into the seed business after he retires from Western Union. Now, the, uh, the arcade was also home to services and institutions that define a city, the courts, the schools, lawyers, doctors, newspapers were located within the arcade. It's where notable innovations were tested, where notable firsts occurred. Um, Thomas Edison ran experiments in the basement of the arcade, uh, experimenting with quadruplex, the ability to send um, uh, two-way telegraph messages on the same wire. George Eastman had his first job as an office boy. George Selden had a workshop there where he worked on the first gasoline engine. Um, the first mayor of Rochester, Jonathan Child, was inaugurated at the arcade. And there were first of the first portrait, the first daguerreotype, the first lithograph, you name it. Many, many firsts happened at the arcade. But it was also our first civic center. It was where abolitionists met to discuss their plans. Many abolitionists spoke at the arcade. Uh, they met to talk about how do we manage the Underground Railroad. It was the center of our professional, civic, and social life for many, many years. Now, I see there are some questions in the chat. Do we know why the roof was replaced? Um, I don't know exactly why. I mean, I do know that when William Reynolds took over the management of the arcade, 
he wanted to make it an attractive place. Um, he was able to make the arcade more financially successful. And I think there was um, an opportunity to, to add, uh, you know, to add more light to it. I don't know whether it was a, an issue of fix or replace. I haven't found any, I haven't found any record of that. Um, I see the caption should read exchange place. Thank you very much for pointing that out. I, I can make that correction. Um, oh, and interesting, someone says, Susan B. Anthony's father and brother-in-law had an insurance office in the arcade. I didn't know that. So thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, like I said, a lot of significant businesses had their start in the arcade. All right, so, but it's, you know, it's significance to the city. And let me just add, I don't think it's significance to the city of Rochester should be or can be underestimated. It was, it played a significant role in, in the origin of many, many significant businesses and significant social movements within the city of Rochester. But it was also the first home to um, an organization that played another significant role in the history of Rochester, and that's the Athenaeum. Now, in 1829, uh, the city fathers, including Nathaniel Rochester and others, were very concerned that the opening of the Erie Canal was drawing an unsavory element to the city, what they called rough canalers, brawling drovers, and wanderers. And so they wanted to do something about it. <clears throat> they wanted to preserve Rochester is an intellectual and, and an intelligent city. So uh, they tried to counterbalance that trend. They wanted to create an organization that would support learning and inquiry and history and literature. So they created the Athenaeum. And you can see the, the mission statement of the Athenaeum there. Their intention was to create a collection of newspapers, books, maps, all sorts of historical and reference materials, as well as literature that would be available to anyone who wanted to expand their mind and to, uh, uh, to, to learn. The cost of entry to the Athenaeum was very low. You could, anyone could join. It was $5 a month. Um, and the uh, collected membership fees were then invested and used to bring in lecturers but also to create a library, a collection of materials that would be available to any of the, the members. Now, uh, of course, it was located in the arcade, again, working to create that foot traffic into the arcade. But you know, to be completely fair, there were not a lot of other places within the city of Rochester that could have housed this growing collection. Now, the Athenaeum was not uh, the only or the first of its type of organization in the city of Rochester. Just a, a, a couple of years before the Athenaeum was created, the Franklin Institute was created. And the Franklin Institute was intended to provide um, uh, 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 practical education for young men to improve their lives. Not long after the Athenaeum was created, the Rochester Library Company was created, which was followed by the Young Men's Society in 1833. In 1836, William Reynolds, Abelard's son, created the Mechanics Literary Association. William felt that the Athenaeum was kind of an old man, stodgy organization. He wanted to create something that was more geared toward the men of his generation, young men, something that was exciting to them um, and provided the kind of information they were interested in. And in 1837, the Young Men's Association was created by Henry Riley. Now, at the time, the city of Rochester did not have enough citizens to support all of these different organizations. And within a couple of years of the founding of each of them, they all experienced some sort of financial concern. Many of these organizations, including the Literary Company, the Young Men's Society, the Young Men's Association, and eventually the Mechanics Literary Association were absorbed into the Athenaeum. So the membership, whatever materials that they collected became part of the collection at the Athenaeum. Now, eventually the Athenaeum runs into its own financial challenges. 
and it merges with the Mechanics Institute in 1885. The Mechanics Institute was created by uh, local businessmen to encourage young men to learn tradesmen skills. Eventually, that combination of the Athenaeum and the Mechanics Institute becomes rebranded as the Rochester Institute of Technology. So the Athenaeum, begun in 1829, eventually becomes RIT and represents for RIT much of the liberal arts focus of the education that engineers and computer scientists and designers uh, are, are required to take at RIT. But let's back up a little bit. Let's, let's you know, not talk about RIT just yet. But let's talk a little bit more about what happened to the Athenaeum. And hang on, there's a question in the chat. Let me take a look. Uh, $5 a month in 1830 is over, you know, 150 a month today, not really affordable for everyone. And, you know, I may have that number wrong. I'm going to fall on my sword there. And, and you're right, $5 is not an insignificant amount of money. The intention was to uh, make it available to anyone who wanted to join. It was a very kind of democratic society. So, yeah, I can do some more research and figure out if that that amount is is correct. That's a, a number that I received from some books. I don't know if it was readjusted for whenever that uh, that particular book was written. All right, so Abelard Reynolds' son, William Abelard Reynolds, takes the Athenaeum to New Heights. He was always committed to this idea of expanding the, um, the, the literary and the intellectual element within the city of Rochester. Now in 1845, William takes over the management of the arcade from Abelard. And in doing so, Abelard gives the deed to the arcade to William. Now, William had already been a successful businessman. He was a respected businessman in the city of Rochester. Um, he, the, the challenge for William was that uh, while Abelard was a visionary, he wasn't necessarily a great manager, which I think is common for founding fathers or, or, or founders of organizations. They get it to a certain point and then they struggle to keep it moving. The, as successful as the arcade was, it was heavily mortgaged. And what Abelard tended to do was take the profits from the arcade and invest them in purchasing other pieces of land rather than paying down the debt. So William takes over the management of the arcade he sorts out all of the financial issues and he expands and improves the arcade. So that new ceiling that you added, that, that you saw, that was on William's watch. Now, William also grows the Athenaeum. He builds on the back of uh, uh, um, the back side of the um, arcade, he builds what's called Corinthian Hall. You can see it there on the right hand side. And it was conveniently located behind the arcade because again, increasing foot traffic, one of the best ways to get to Corinthian Hall was to walk through the arcade. Now the building itself, Corinthian Hall was a mixed use facility. There was a performance space on the ground floor and the library. So the uh, storage facility for all the materials as well as reading rooms was uh, located on the top floor. Now, in its heyday, Corinthian Hall hosted many, many speakers, Charles Dickens, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Horace Greeley, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, Frederick Douglass delivered his What is the Fourth of July to the Negro speech in Corinthian Hall. Jenny Lind performed there, and the spiritualist Fox Sisters uh, demonstrated their spirit wrappings in Corinthian Hall. Now, the proceeds from Cor Corinthian Hall, all the ticket sales, uh, funded the Athenaeum. And by 1857, the Athenaeum is completely debt free. Unfortunately, the good years did not last long. By, eight, by the Civil War years, um, the were tough ones. The, many of the men who had supported the Athenaeum and Corinthian Hall were off at war. Um, many uh, citizens in Rochester were struggling financially, and so the Athenaeum started to lose money. 
By 1865, William is forced to sell Corinthian Hall. It continues for a number of years afterwards, but never quite the intellectual center of Rochester that it used to be. William becomes president of the Rochester Savings Bank. And I guess as president, you're, you can do whatever you want with the building you're moving into. He moves the entire collection of the Athenium to the upper rooms of the Rochester Savings Bank. And he creates sort of a public library available on the upper floors of the Rochester Savings Bank. Now, a few short years after that, William dies unexpectedly. He's only 61 when he dies. And um, upon his death, uh, the Athenium starts into kind of a death spiral. It is evicted from the Rochester Savings Bank. It has racked up significant debts. It eventually files for bankruptcy. And the creditors of the Athenium force a sale of the assets, all of the books, that huge collection at a public auction. And the entire collection sells for $3,350. Now, as we said, eventually the Athenium is absorbed into the Mechanics Institute. But the question is what happened to that wonderful collection of books? Who bought it at the sheriff's auction? Enter this guy, Abelard's second son, Mortimer Fabricus. Now, let me just say, they don't make names like Mortimer Fabricus anymore. Mortimer used to like to say that he was the first white child born in the 100 acre tract. And there were at least two other people who made that same claim. And I guess it all depends on how you define Rochester. For example, Enos Stone's son, remember we talked about Enos, he was the sales agent. Enos Stone's son also made the same claim, but that was challenged because many people said, well, Enos Stone's son was actually born in Pittsburgh, not in Rochester. In any event, this is what Mortimer liked to, to tell folks. Now Mortimer, like his brother, was very successful as a businessman outside of the arcade. But when William dies, uh, Ra uh, Mortimer sells his seed business. He'd been involved in railroads. He, he exits all of these businesses to run the arcade. Now, Mortimer is the person who buys the collection at the sheriff's sale. He and George Riley pool their money together and purchase the entire collection but don't really know what to do with it. They have no place to put it. It sits in storage for a number of years. And then Mortimer opens what's called Reynolds Library in the arcade in 1886. And again, a brilliant place to put a library because it increases foot traffic into the arcade. Now, he also is a philanthropist in his own right. He donated a significant amount of money to build a YMCA building. Um, he also donated the funds to build a chemistry lab for the University of Rochester in William's name. William was a trustee of the University of Rochester. Now, Mortimer very much wanted to preserve the legacy of the Reynolds family, especially when it came to the intellectual life of the city. And so he devotes his final years to saving the library as a memorial to the family. Now, when he dies, when Mortimer dies in 1892, he leaves his home, which you can see there in the picture on the left, the entire collection of the Reynolds Library and the arcade itself to the Library Board of Trustees. The idea being that the proceeds from the arcade would fund the library. Now, the proceeds from the arcade were also used to renovate Mortimer's home so that it could accommodate the library. They did an extensive renovation to make it more suited to housing a library. That first floor was the reading room where all the books were stored. The second floor contained both a lecture hall and it also contained offices, the second and third floor housed the offices for the Rochester Historical Society, the Monroe County Medical Society, and the Rochester Engineering Society. Now, it continues like this for a number of years, but by the 19, late 1920s, um, the mansion itself was viewed as inadequate 
for the collection. And the collection had grown, um, the building itself was old, it needed extensive renovations, and neither the Reynolds family nor the board of trustees of the library had the funds to undertake such a renovation. So they looked for opportunities to combine the Reynolds Library collection with other libraries within the city, whether it was the Rochester Public Library or the Rush Reese Library at U of R, but none of those associations have worked out. Now in 1931, the city council passed a resolution to fund and create plans for a central library in the city of Rochester. And that library would be funded by a grant from the Rundell Memorial Fund, as well as a public works grant and proceeds from the Reynolds Arcade. Now in 1933, they chose a location on the Genesee River. It's where you see the library now, South Avenue between Court and Broad Streets. It was gonna be called the Rundell Memorial Building and within it is the Reynolds Reference Library. So the Reynolds Reference Library was eventually incorporated into the Rochester Public Library and continues to this day. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that story I uh, hinted at at the beginning, that salacious little story that was uh, almost on a regular basis on the front page of the Democrat and Chronicle. Now, you know, as I've talked about um, the Reynolds Library, it was clear that Mortimer held, was the owner of the arcade. So how did that come to be? How did Mortimer become the owner of the arcade? Well, when, uh, when William Reynolds took over the management of the arcade, Abelard, his father gave him the deed to the arcade. So in 1845, William, became the owner of the arcade. Now, William, when he died at age 61, he died intestate, meaning he had no will. Now, William had no heirs. William uh, was married for a brief time, but his wife died just 15 months after they were married. They had no children and William never married again. So in dying intestate, the court determined that Abelard was William's heir and the ownership of the arcade reverted to Abelard. Now, when Mortimer takes over the management of the arcade um, after William's death, he doesn't become the owner. Abelard continues to own the arcade. Now, when Abelard dies at age 93, Mortimer is his only surviving child. Uh, William has already died. Abelard had two daughters, both of whom predeceased Abelard. Those two daughters each had their own daughter. So there are three heirs to Abelard Reynolds. There is Mortimer and the two granddaughters, Clara McAlpin Amsden and Sophia Strong. Now, there was some discussion as to whether or not Abelard should have a will at all. Um, this particular article talks about some importunities. In other words, there was a lot of pressure apparently on Abelard to leave me this piece of property, leave me a, a specific type of money, uh, a specific amount of money. There was a lot of politicking within, within the family. Mortimer thought that there should either be no will, in other words, let the courts sort it out independent of the family, or that a will should be drawn up that leaves a third to each of those three heirs, a third to Mortimer and one third to each of the granddaughters. And in fact, Mortimer asks Henry Selden to create a will for Abelard that does essentially that, that leaves a third, a third, a third to each of the three heirs. And that's essentially what would have happened if, 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 if Abelard had died intestate intestate, the court would have given a third to each of his three heirs. He sends, uh, uh, William, uh, Henry Selden sends this will to Abelard Reynolds for his review. Abelard refuses to sign it. And, and William, excuse me, Henry Selden then goes on to represent, uh, um, will, excuse me, Mortimer 
in this contesting of the, of the will. Um, and incidentally, Henry Selden was also, uh, also represented Susan B. Anthony in her trial following her 1872 um, voting in the general election. Now, in the meantime, Abelard writes his own will, which is drawn up and witnessed by Judge Samuel Selden, Henry Selden's brother. In Abelard's version of the will, he leaves the family house and its contents to Lydia, his wife. He also leaves Lydia some money. He leaves uh, lump sums to each of his granddaughters, the interest of which is to be paid to those granddaughters in installments um, every year. Mortimer gets everything else. He gets the arcade and he gets the income from the arcade. Well, needless to say, the granddaughters were not having it. They were not at all happy with uh, this will or they were not at all happy with the decision. And they contest it on two grounds. Number one, that Abelard was without testamentary capacity, meaning he didn't have the mental capacity or the understanding required to make a valid will. But they also contend that the favorable terms of the will, favorable toward Mortimer, were procured by Mortimer. In other words, Mortimer unduly influenced his father to leave the bulk of the estate to him. Now, each side, when it goes to court, each side brings a parade of witnesses, which which provide strikingly contradictory testimony. The witnesses for the granddaughters talk about how Abelard was basically a blithering idiot by the time that he died. He was stone deaf. <laughs> he, he was stone deaf. He couldn't remember people. He didn't remember. He, he, he spent most of the day sleeping in his study. Um, he didn't remember anything. He couldn't read. He couldn't work. He didn't recognize anyone. The witnesses for Mortimer tell a very different story. They talk about how uh, Abelard went to his office in the arcade every single day. He carried on correspondence. He was still very active in the Masons. Now, what strikes me is I read all of these different articles. What struck me about the coverage of this particular event was the reporting of it in the Democrat and Chronicle. There was such an incredible amount of detail that was provided, but also as we think about privacy in our lives today, there was no privacy. The entire content of the will, every single clause of the will was published at least twice in its entirety on the front page of the Democrat and Chronicle. Any citizen of Rochester, anyone who read the paper knew who got exactly what, how much money, when it was supposed to be delivered, it was incredible to me. Um, and the testimony of the witnesses was provided more or less verbatim. You knew who the witness was and you knew just about everything that they said. It's astonishing to me, but it had to have made riveting reading to people within the city of Rochester. Now this went on for nine months. Um, and finally, the judge, the Honorable W. Dean Schuert, delivered his decision. And first of all, how beautiful is this document? This is a, a couple of clips from a lengthy handwritten document with the judge's decision. Um, the judge rules for the uh, rules on the side of Mortimer. He uh, finds that there is no undue influence. He finds that Abelard was in fact of sound mind and that the will stands and should be submitted to probate. And what he says is, you know, he, he cites a couple of pieces of evidence, one of which are letters that Abelard wrote in his own hand. He carried on correspondence within just a couple of months of his death and long after he created the will that shows a clear hand, a clear thinking. But he also talks about how uh, uh, Abelard, as a prelate of the Masons, had was responsible for carrying out very complex um, rites within uh, the Masonic organization that he was able to do very well with no assistance from others. So uh, the will stands as it was. 
So finally, you know, this would not be morning in the morning without a review of the Reynolds family plot at Mount Hope Cemetery. And to me, it's a very interesting one. Um, the plot itself is in section R, it's plot 85. It's a, a very large plot. Uh, you can see it here in the picture on the left. Um, it is um, surrounded by a low stone fence, which runs the perimeter with an opening in the front. There is a large center stone, which you see there, it's an obelisk. Um, the lot was purchased by William Reynolds. Um, the center obelisk has carving on, uh, on three sides and you can see those three sides in those pictures. The first side is um, in tribute to Gamaliel Reynolds, Abelard's father, William's grandfather and his wife, Mary. The second side is commemorates William Reynolds and his wife, Sophia. And the third side commemorates Mary Eliza Reynolds, one of the sisters of William and Mortimer. The fourth side does not have any carving and you can just barely see the Reynolds name at the base of um, the obelisk. There are 18 stones in the plot for the 18 family members who are buried there and just outside uh, uh, just outside the, the front perimeter of the plot are also uh, graves for um, a couple of the granddaughters' families. Now, you can see one of those individual stones in the lower left corner of the, the large picture on the left. Here is a close up of those individual stones. They're marked with kind of fam familiar family names mother, father, aunt, uncle, sister. You can see here the stones for Lydia and uh, Abelard, which are at the top labeled mother and father. And below them are the stones for their four children, Clarissa, Mary, William. And on the right is Mortimer. It's designated as MFR, a little bit of a different um, a naming strategy than in the others. Now, there are no actual names on these individual stones, just the kind of the family, the family name. Now there are other family plots like this at Mount Hope. The individual stones are left with a, a first name or, or mother or something like that. Um, but the individuals are commemorated, full name, birth and death dates, usually in that center stone. That doesn't happen in this particular family plot. The only way that this, that you would know that this is Abelard Reynolds is to check the birth and the death dates, which correspond to when he was born and when he died. There is nothing in this plot that gives Abelard's name nor Lydia's name. Now, when I first went looking for Abelard, I couldn't find him. I mean, I found the Reynolds plot, but I looked at all of those stones. There was no mention of Abelard. I wasn't even sure that I was in the right place, the only way to locate his stone, the only way I could find it was to find his birth and his death dates. And what struck me about this was that for a family that did so much to create the city of Rochester, to make Rochester what it is, there is very little physical evidence to commemorate them. And I found that um, more than a little bit more than a little bit sad. And Mortimer is only MFR. It would be hard to know exactly who that was referring to. So there you can see Abelard in all of his Masonic regalia splendor. You know, when Abelard dies at age 93, he is cited as the oldest living resident of Rochester. Lydia uh, goes on to live to 102 and she too, is the oldest living citizen in Rochester at the time of, of her death. Imagine all that they saw in their lifetime. When they came to Rochester, there were fewer than 100 citizens. When Abelard dies, there are close to 80,000 residents. And when Lydia dies, there are close to 100,000 residents. But what a legacy that this family left in Rochester, not only the arcade, but all of the things that sprung out of it, the Athenium, the Reynolds Library, the philanthropy that they offered to the city. I you know, very, very much want to uh, make sure that their memory is remembered within the city and their contributions to who we are 
as a city are remembered. All right, so thank you for your attention through all of that. Um, well, I'd love to take your questions, take your comments. Let's get a discussion going. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, there are two questions in the chat. Uh, they're actually sent directly to me uh, okay. that I'd like to ask on uh, Judy Toyer's behalf. Uh, first off, can Sarah share her resources for the statements that the arcade was, quote, a rostrum for abolitionists, unquote, and a place where plans were hatched for the Underground Railroad, unquote? I can certainly dig that up for you um, and, and send those. So if, you know, Brandon, you can share with me um, some contact information, perhaps, I'd be happy to, to share that with you. I don't have it. I don't have it offhand. All right, I will send you her email separately. Thank you. Another question that she asked that's perhaps simpler to answer. Uh, on a graphic of Rochester's early population, Sarah indicated that no one living in Rochester was a, quote, native, unquote, and the, quote, oldest native was 17, unquote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who does she mean by the term native? Indigenous native, peoples? Native meaning born in the 100 acre tract. That was the reference that I was, that I was making. And that was something that had been noted in some of the early histories of Rochester. That even as late as the, you know, the opening of the Erie Canal and beyond, the only people, and I think the reference is that Rochester grew from transplants to the area. It was a growing city that attracted people um, and not a city that had as yet been growing kind of organically through the expansion of its citizenship, but rather it was a, a, an, a city born of transplants. Thank you. Uh, there is, an, let's see, sorry, I've had a couple more things come in. Yeah, yeah, uh, this yeah. Is from, this is from Joyce. What is the relationship to the current Reynolds Arcade? So the, uh, the Reynolds Arcade, as you know, as, as I mentioned before, where at the time of Mortimer's death, the arcade passed out of the Reynolds family and became, uh, was, was willed to the uh, trustees of the Reynolds Library. Um, and the, 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 the arcade itself, you know, was very old. It had been um, updated numerous times to add heat, eventually to add electricity. In 1909, there was a fire in the arcade that was actually caused by um, Western Union wires in the ceiling of the arcade that did significant amount of damage. Um, eventually, the arcade itself was seen as something of a fire trap. In 1832, the arcade was sold by the trustees of the library um, to uh, a group of businessmen who eventually tore it down and replaced it with another building. There is no connection to those two buildings other than the name on the front. And I think some of the interior design of the first floor is intended to be something of an homage to what the Reynolds Arcade must have looked at. But there is no business connection between, between the two. Gotcha. Excuse me. So the next question here, this is from Susan. Uh, mm -hmm. Who did the Reynolds Arcade murals and are there any pictures of these murals? I don't know who did that. That's a great question. And I couldn't find any pictures of the murals. They were referred to in multiple documents that I read in preparing for this, but I don't, and, and maybe Brandon, you with the work that you've done for the library, maybe you would have some access to pictures, but I can't find any. Uh, we do not have an extensive collection of 19th century building photos at all. So I've never seen pictures of them either. Uh, anything that we have would show up in the Rochester Images collection if someone wanted to check. Um, I would do that right now if I wasn't managing the questions. Yeah. <laughs> eventually, the, eventually the murals were covered up and I don't know exactly when that happened. It might be that that happened before photography was easily accessible. So there may not be any photographs of, of what those murals actually look like. Gotcha. And it's interesting to me, just, just as an aside, why Niagara Falls? Why not High Falls? It was very curious to me why it was Niagara Falls, but I, I don't have a good explanation. I don't have a good explanation for that. 
Um, so Cynthia, would you like to jump in with your question? Oh, we can unmute ourselves. Yes. Uh, regarding more, regarding travel in the early 19th century before the um, Erie Canal was opened, we mentioned looking out the window to the, the snow and Sarah mentioned why February. Um, surprisingly, winter travel, according to a number of histories, was preferred because to get across New York State, you had one option. It was the state road, which is Route 5 and 20. And in mm -hmm. winter, the road was frozen. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot easier than any other time of year. They didn't have road crews out there taking care of the ruts and the mud. And right. there's a quote in one of the Albany newspapers that cites Last weekend, 1,200 sleighs left Albany for the Western lands. And when they mean sleighs, they mean big, heavy travel sleighs, not those romantic cutters that you mm -hmm. see for two people. So it wasn't unusual before the canal opened, yeah. of course, that you did travel in winter yeah. because the frozen roads were yeah. most easily traveled. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, absolutely. But it had to have been a rough trip. I mean, you're you're basically exposed to the cold, and even though you're maybe going a little bit faster and it's easier, it still had to be a difficult a difficult trip. And to to find yourself in cold, snowy Rochester and with a young child had to have been a, a real challenge for the family. It was a, certainly a huge adventure. And in terms mm -hmm. of other um, buildings similar to the um, arcade. I believe there was a previous arcade in Hartford, Connecticut that may have been the first building like that in the United States, but it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't too much earlier. Yeah, and I don't know that it was as large. I mean, when you think about it, there are other buildings like Quincy Market in Boston, but you know that, that was very, very different. Those were basically vendor stalls. Um, they weren't individual rooms. They weren't, uh, it wasn't multiple stories, so... No, and this was the Western frontier, frankly, of the United States. We wasn't exactly post city. Yeah, Thanks. Exactly. Wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, let's see here. There's a wonderful comment here from C and Jell. Uh, thank you very much. My family was in Rochester by 1817. The history is fascinating. And one of the lawyers in the trial over Abelard's will, James C. Cochran, was a member of my extended family. Isn't that crazy? I mean, the thing that I, I find most interesting about the research that I've done at Mount Hope are the interconnections of all of the people who are buried there. So, you know, not too far from Susan B. Anthony is the grave of Henry Selden, who was her attorney, and he's not too far from Abelard Reynolds. He was his attorney as well. And all of these kind of individual families come together. And it's so fascinating to me to see how all of these different family lines intersect um, with each other. Yeah, I see there's a question on School 42 on Lake Avenue is named for Abelard Reynolds. Yes, That's yeah. absolutely right. I don't know when that occurred. If you go to the, the, the website of the school, Abelard Reynolds School, um, there's not much information about it. There's a little bit of information, a very brief biography about Abelard and the arcade, but it doesn't go much farther um, than that. Did he have any connection? Did, oh, so yeah, you're, it, it's an interesting question. I didn't make that connection. I mean, he had gone up to Charlotte, um, but I don't, I don't know that the, the location of the school near Charlotte had anything to do with um, it being chosen as, as the namesake school. Do you know anything about Lydia's life after she nursed her husband back to health? You know, the, it's very difficult to find any information about kind of any woman at the time um, in the early 19th century. Um, but I didn't hear much about Lydia's life. And I only found one photograph of Lydia um, at the Rochester Historical Society. I haven't found any pictures of Lydia published in any books or any of the history of Rochester um, kinds of books. Um, you know, she just kind of kept the family running. She took care of four children. Um, Abelard farmed for a period of time. He moved the family a number of times in the course of her being, of their being alive. Uh, it, it's interesting when, um, when the will was being contested, um, Mortimer was actually very disappointed with what Lydia was left with. She got the house, which is a beautiful house. She got the contents of the house um, and she got some money, but she felt, he felt as though she, 
kind of got the raw end of the deal that that she had lived with Abelard, had married him for many, you know, they were married for decades. She came west with him. She kept everything running while he, you know, did great things. Um, and and Mortimer honestly felt she deserved better than than what uh, what she had given. see here. So I have three questions from James Swartz. Mm -hmm. um, first off, can you please clarify the location of the original arcade and Corinthian Hall? So the, um, let me go back and I'm going to pull up. Um, hang on. Oop, I don't know what just happened here. Let me pull up the, um, that map again and make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. All right, so here's, we're at Main Street and State at the Four Corners. You can see it says Reynolds Arcade. Right behind it is Corinthian Street. Now, the Corinthian Hall, as I said, um, uh, ex existed for a period of time after William sold it. It eventually becomes kind of a vaudeville um, theater. Um, not nearly the intellectual powerhouse that it was intended to be, but it would be, the arcade is here, and the Corinthian Hall would be right behind it um, in, in what would be called Corinthian, Corinthian Street. The, the, the building is no more, it's, it's, it, is long, it is long since gone. So his second question, uh, do you know when the first bridge was opened to connect the east and west side of the Genesee River at what is now Main Street? So let me go back again, because in this 1814 map, you can see the bridge there. It's listed as, uh, well, it actually doesn't have a name, but you can see the bridge there. So it was at least, I think, 1812 or 1811 that that bridge was built. So when Nathaniel Rochester and his colleagues laid out kind of the basics of what this 100 acre track would look like, um, they, that the bridge was, was part of that. So I'm going to say 1811, 1812. Does that sound about right to that you, sounds, Brandon? That sounds about right to me. Um, I know I've heard the exact date before and it was extremely early. It was the first bridge mm -hmm. across the Genesee. And his final question, how did that affect the usage of the Reynolds Arcade? Well, it had to have helped. I mean, it connected the east side of the city with the west side of the city and both sides of the city were certainly, um, uh, you know, being developed simultaneously. So it, it certainly preceded the arcade by many, many years. It wasn't built to support the arcade, but as the city grew and expanded on both sides of the river, certainly the ability for people to access the arcade easily um, benefited its, its growth as a center for Rochester. Okay. We don't have any more questions in the chat at this point. Cynthia Hauk does make an interesting comment, though, mm -hmm. that regarding selection of Niagara Falls for the arcade mural, as it was internationally famous as a destination for early tourism, yeah. that might have been the reason it was selected as the subject. That's entirely possible, that it was something to kind of inspire people to go even further west to visit this great natural wonder. Do we have any other questions? comments, et cetera. Well, if not, thank you so much for attending. Um, I truly appreciate it. It has been my absolute pleasure to do the research for this and to dip deeper into the Reynolds family and the history of the arcade. And I've learned so much about just the history of Rochester because the arcade is so central to so many things that happened in the city. So. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share this research with you. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. This was a wonderful and uh, really enlightening presentation. Um, Reynolds' name is, of course, a familiar one, with Reynolds Library being such a foundational element in my own employer's history. <laughs> so uh, thank you for bringing more information to us and helping to explain uh, this whole Reynolds connection with us and with the city of Rochester as a whole. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is our last presentation in the Morning in the Morning series for this year. Uh, hopefully we'll be returning in September. Until then, bye-bye.